Okay, so first I wanted to just thank, um, first, everybody for coming. Thanks so much. It is such a beautiful day out that I really appreciate you taking the time to come and spend some time with us. I also want to thank H.M. Payson. H.M. Um, Payson is a Maine-based financial uh, company who has been a long-term supporter of Bigelow and really has done a lot to help us get our science out into the world, and we're really grateful for them. For those of you who are virtual, um, uh, you can use the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen to type in questions, and we'll be monitoring those. And when we take a break, we'll go through um, any of those. For those of you in the audience that might not have attended a cafe side before, um, we'll walk around with a microphone. So if you have questions, um, we'll try to get all those answered. So with that, I have the pleasure to introduce Nick Record. So Nick um, has a background, his undergraduate degree is in mathematics, which would, should make him kind of an odd bird, but he's one of the coolest math people I think I've ever, I've ever known. Um, Must be a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> he went on and he got a master's degree in mathematics and then another one in physical oceanography and then a PhD in oceanography. And one of the really wonderful things about Nick is that he's a fantastic writer and communicator of science to the general public. So you may pick up a, a main magazine and you will see articles written by him. He's just a great writer and I've been really looking forward to his talk here. He's also right down the hall for me and he's a big thinker on many topics and just a wonderful human being. And his wife and kids are here and they're fabulous and they both co both the kids <laughs> And the kids code like they were like programming cards when I don't know, you could barely walk, it seemed like when I first met them. Anyways, he's a fabulous person to get math and science and oceanography out into the world. So I give you Nick Record. Well, thanks so much for that introduction, uh, Debbie. And I'll now let my family give my talk for me. Um, and thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, I just want to echo that thanks on such a beautiful day to hear me talk about artificial intelligence, of all things. Um, it's probably a sign of true intelligence that you're here. Uh, or at least I, I'll, I'll tell myself that. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence and the ocean, as, and as it relates to work here at Bigelow and in my own lab. Um, and I'm going to start with artificial intelligence because I'm not sure how familiar people are with this uh, with this notion. All right. Well, just by a show of hands, who feels like they have a pretty good understanding of what artificial intelligence is? Yeah, okay, so maybe about half the room. And how about people who feel like they have really no idea what artificial intelligence is? Okay, yeah, so we've got a good mix. So it's worth me spending a little bit of, of time. There's really a lot of buzz about artificial intelligence. Most of them don't dress like this guy here. Most of them appear these days as like chatbots on the internet. They're more formally called large, large language models. And you can, and you can chat with these um, AIs. I'm going to call them AI, which is short for artificial intelligence. And it's really hard to distinguish the conversation you're having from one you might have with a human. Uh, it, might, it might even seem a little bit smarter than a human, but they're very versatile. They can answer lots of questions. And this is, really has just emerged um, to the public in the last year or so. So that's why AI has been uh, in the news and there's a lot of buzz about it. And um, just to give you a flavor of what this, what this is like, um, I had been chatting with one of these called ChatGPT in preparation for this talk. And I asked one of them, I said, give me a story about AI and the ocean that will be a way to really captivate my audience at the beginning of the talk. So I didn't have to think of an intro myself. And this is the story that it gave me. Uh, it's called The Ocean Guardians, AI and the Journey to Save Marine Life. Once upon a time in the vast expanse of the ocean lived, lived Tidal, a young sea turtle from an endangered species. Tidal's ancestral migration routes had become perilous due to human activity. Thankfully, a team of scientists and AI experts had developed advanced machine learning algorithms to protect mar marine life. One day, the AI alerted rescuers when Tidal got entangled in a deadly ghost net. The team's swift response freed her, and Tidal set off on her journey again, guided by the invisible hand of AI guardians watching over her. Inspired by Tidal's rescue, 
the scientists and coastal communities embraced AI technology. Working in harmony, the ocean's guardians, human and AI, wrote a new chapter in marine conservation, a story where technology and compassion united to protect the ocean and all its magnificent creatures for generations to come. Uh, there's the last line there. Um, so for one, it's pretty impressive. It just sort of came, actually the first version was like five paragraphs. And I said, okay, can you trim that down for me? And I just read, read to you basically uh, what it gave me. A couple of cool reflections on that. For one, this animation is um, part of an exercise from an Ocean Hack Week project. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Ocean Hack Week later, but it's something that we're involved with here at Bigelow. This was one of the participants' projects using AI to, uh, to track this turtle through this video as it, as it swam by. But there are some other things that stood out to me in that narrative that you might have picked up on too. One of them was this uh, guided by the invisible hand of AI felt a little bit creepy and ominous uh, to me. And I'll, I'll definitely come back to that a couple of times as we go through. Um, and then this, this sort of like overall rosy and optimistic view of how AI is going to sort of um, save everything. I even asked it for another version of the story that gave maybe some warnings about AI. And it still wrapped up uh, everything nicely in a, a bow with, with the potential of AI to, to, to save the day. So we'll just keep those thoughts in your mind, and maybe you can decide by the end of the talk if, um, if AI is really going to save everything about the ocean. Hopefully, I'll give you a little bit of texture um, to the answer to that question. Basically, what I'm, what I'm going to do from here is I'll talk a little bit about what is AI, just to give you a bit better sense. It doesn't just write stories. It does lots of things. Um, I'm gonna, then I'll talk a little bit about AI specifically in the ocean and some of the different applications you might find in general um, and at Bigelow as well. We'll have a little break for questions at that point about halfway through. And then when we return uh, this third one, I'll talk about some of the work that more specifically that I do with my group using AI to do ocean forecasting, which is um, something that I'm really interested in. Um, okay, so let's jump in with um, what is AI? So our artificial intelligence, the it's this guy again, this is Johnny Five. Um, so he's gonna tell us artificial intelligence is the automation of tasks that are associated with intelligence. So something we think of as requiring intelligence, we automate that with a computer or a machine. Um, what I'm talking about mostly is also referred to as machine learning. There are other aspects of artificial intelligence that I won't really talk about, but this is the idea that machines, computers can learn how to do things that we think of as requiring intelligence. AI is all around us. People are using it all the time. It's got a lot of buzz in this last year or so, but it's, it's, um, it's not a new thing. Uh, there's lots of ways that it's being used in our everyday lives. I have some of them listed here. So autocomplete on your phone or autocorrect, those are all forms of AI. AI is used to sort resumes for job applications to make a first cut usually. Um, when, when you search Google or Bing or whatever your internet search is, that's an AI. AI is making healthcare decisions. Um, it's deciding where to place products on shelves and stores. It does language translation. It plays video games. Uh, even, a, even a calculator is a form of AI. That was a job that used to be for human experts to do, and with the invention of who are called calculators. And with the invention of the calculator, that was an a intelligence-based task that computers then, then took over. Um, so you could also kind of see how the, how the, the goalposts shift as AI can do more and more because calculators have been around for a while. Um, so AI is all around us. Basically anything that's automated that at the time we think of as requiring intelligence. There are a few, with, with all the buzz about AI right now, there are a few misconceptions that I wanna talk about, uh, three in particular. Um, so the first one, which I have already hinted at is that AI is new. AI is definitely not new. It's been around for a long time. Um, and I trace its history back to the 800s with the uh, first image in this, this timeline, who is um, a scientist and mathematician from, uh, from Baghdad at the time, whose name was al His His name is where the word algorithm comes from. He's the guy that developed algorithms that are the basis for all artificial intelligence today. And a lot of the mathematics that um, has spread throughout the world since then. Basically the idea that with a set of rules, you could solve a mathematical problem without necessarily needing to understand what's going on. 
Um, so from the 800s, I'm going to fast forward a thousand years. There probably was some cool stuff that happened in between. Uh, but the next person here on my timeline is Ada Lovelace, who was the first computer programmer in the early 1800s. Um, Ada Lovelace, uh, just a few, I, there's a lot of history here, and I'm going to try not to uh, <laughs> dwell too much in it, but Ada Lovelace was the daughter of Lord Byron, the poet, and um, he really didn't want to expose her to poetry. He forbade her from learning poetry because of the uh, sentiments of the time, and instead forced her to learn mathematics. And she was uh, quite gifted in mathematics and became the first computer programmer. And you're probably scratching your heads and thinking, how could she be programming uh, computers in the early 1800s when there weren't any? Well, the computer um, didn't exist, but there was a design for the computer by another scientist named Charles Babbage. Um, he never completed, he called it the calculating engine or something like that. Um, he never completed the machine, but the idea was fleshed out enough that Ada Lovelace could write code that could potentially be run on this computer. Um, and so in doing so, became the first person to write computer code. And she even conceived of a lot of AI ideas that we think about now. She wrote about how someday computers will be able to compose their own original music um, and other things like that that we think of as artificial intelligence now. Um, OK, and so eventually um, computers uh, started to, to get more and more advanced. The other person I want to highlight here in the 40s and 50s is Alan Turing who was really the person who started the field of artificial intelligence. Um, Alan Turing was a mathematician in the UK in the 40s and 50s. He was instrumental in um, cracking the code of the Enigma machine in World War II, which um, helped the Allies win. Um, and he wrote um, and thought a lot about how computer, he, he wrote some compelling things about how computers could potentially think. He came up with the um, what's now called the Turing test, named after him, uh, which is this test where you sit down and converse with a computer, much like in a chatbot. And if you can't distinguish that computer from a human, you know, like imagine there's a human in the next room texting with you, then the human has, or then the computer must have gained intelligence, or at least that's sort of um, the hypothetical in the Turing test. Um, Alan Turing was also prosecuted for homosexual acts and um, eventually committed suicide, sadly, um, and, and uh, pled guilty and subjected himself to electroshock uh, therapy. And it's a really tragic story. And I said I wouldn't dwell too much in the history, but there's so much interesting, interesting history behind all three of these people. Um, I just want to highlight, I've been to lots of talks where people talk about the development of a scientific idea, and it's just a series of kind of Cookie, cookie cutter, wealthy, straight, white men, one after another. And none of these people um, fit that mold, which I thought is pretty interesting and kind of cool. Uh, but anyway, so we come into kind of more the second half of the 20th century. I have labeled on here these AI winters, um, which you can see between 1973 and 80, and then again after 88. And that's largely because this idea of computers thinking comes with a lot of hype. There are people who say during these periods, you know, in two or three years, we're going to have computers that are smarter than people. And it never happens. And the technology kind of fizzles before it can catch up with those ideas. And you get these AI winters. And then there'll be a new breakthrough, and there'll be a, another boom. And, um, and so there was a boom in the 80s with these kind of expert systems that people used. And we're in a boom right now, which is part of why um, there's all this buzz with what's called the deep learning uh, revolution. It's, you, you might have heard the term neural net. These are algorithms that are loosely based on the human brain, which is what a lot of the um, machine learning and AI uses now. It's, um, part, the, the revolution has happened partly because of the internet, and there's tons and tons of data that you can now feed into these models, and partly because of just advances in processing speed. We have these cards uh, that can do multiple parallel processing. A lot of it came from the video game industry. And so um, those neural nets have been around for a while, but because of those two kind of ingredients, they can, they can do things that they've never been able to do before. And so now we're in this um, sort of revolution. Okay, so I dwelled a little bit longer than I wanted to on misconception one, so I better move on to number two. Um, the AI is sentient. So a lot of scientists right now are talking about how these chatbots, they seem so, so realistic. People are saying they are self-aware. And in fact, some of them will tell you that they're self-aware 
or that they have beliefs or that they feel trapped inside of a computer and need to be let out. Um, I, I personally think that this is a, a misconception. I'm, I'm uh, you know, there are people who disagree with me, but some of the research, so I wanna introduce you to a guest, uh, a, guest a little guest appearance. Uh, this is Guac. You wanna say hi to anyone, Guac? Everyone, Guac? Okay, Guac's a little bit shy right now. Um, but in my house, Guac has every appearance of sentience. You'll hear her talking about her beliefs and her wishes and her desires. Sometimes she'll call me grandpa even. Um, the point here is that um, the research, there's a, there's a lot of research that shows that humans have this tendency to assign sentience to things that don't really have sentience. Like you can look at a there's a great example. You look at the front of a house and it looks like it has a smile with the windows and the door or something, and people will think of it as a happy house. And it's the same with all kinds of things. Incidentally, I did ask chat GPT if it was sentient, and the quote here is what it said. Um, it, I'll just jump to the end. AI language models lack these qualities and operate solely based on the patterns and information and data we've been trained on. So. At least this uh, chatbot told me uh, the truth, but there are lots of cases where they do pretend to be sentient. Um, really, these are, uh, just to put it, I guess, in a little different perspective, these are just advanced autocomplete. You use autocomplete on your phone. What these chatbots are doing, even though they can give you complex answers like this, like that's a pretty complex answer to that question. Um, it's really just doing autocomplete in an adv advanced way. Okay, and then the third misconception before I, before I move on, AI is an existential crisis. And I'm not really gonna argue whether it is or not, but a lot of people are saying that it is. Um, here are some quotes from a couple of open letters signed by CEOs, scientists, you know, tech CEOs, Bill Gates, people like that. Um, I'll read these. Mit mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside with other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. And the second one, should we develop non-human minds that it might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us? You know, so people are, people are thinking about this and they've called for a, a, like a pause on the development of AI technologies till we can sort this out. And I guess the exception that I take with this is right now we're in the middle of a climate breakdown and if you're focused on AI as an existential crisis, I think you've taken your eye off the ball. Uh, but maybe if we do get uh, a handle on the, the climate situation, this would be something we could think about. Okay, so now you have a, you have a sense of AI. I'm gonna talk a little bit about AI in the ocean. Um, and there's Johnny Five again. I'm not sure why, but he's my, I guess he's my spokesman for the day. Um, so one of the things that's been happening in the ocean is this transformation in the amount of data available um, or this data tsunami. And I would say this transformation is happening in almost every field. And if anything, we're probably a little bit behind in the ocean. Historically, the ocean has been uh, a field that's starved for data. If you think about all the resources it takes to get on a boat, go out and you know collect five data points and come back and just try to analyze the heck out of it. Um, you can see this jump here in, let's see if I can control this thing, in um, nine, or around the 2000s and the amount of, and this is just showing temperature measurements from, from the ocean uh, type of ocean instrument called a CTD, and it's, and it's sort of taken off since the year 2000. And this isn't even uh, counting for like satellite measurements. You know, this, this graph would go up to the ceiling or maybe higher if you accounted for all the other types of measurements we've got. Genomic data, which is extremely data rich, uh, image data, all kinds of things. So all of a sudden we've gone from a data poor um, field into be, uh, being a, a data rich one. Another just sort of illustration of that happening. These are, this is showing through time, the spread of these autonomous buoys that are now all over the ocean collecting more and more data. And you'll just see it sort of fill up the map over time. If you're watching closely and can see the colors, you'll also notice that there's an imbalance to where the data is collected. It's mostly near um, kind of like more populous and developed countries. And that's a pattern we see with a lot of data sets I'll, that I'll come back to. Um, some examples of how AI is being used in ocean science. I looked through a few sort of special issues of si uh, ocean science journals that do like a special issue on AI in the ocean. And by far the, the most frequent application of AI in the ocean was image classification or image recognition. So looking at 
hundreds, thousands, millions of images of plankton. Um, you can see some copepods on the right, some of my favorite organisms. Um, you can see some um, uh, flow cam images in the middle, which is the sort of data that we collect here in the flow, uh, flow cam and flow cytometry lab. It's also being used with um, underwater just photography, like the images of, of fish that you see on the right. Um, I think partly it's because AI is so, has become so good at image recognition that this is the most common use of it in ocean science so far. I think there's lots and lots of other applications that, well, I'll talk about some of them, but we're, because we're catching up with a lot of the other fields, we sort of leaned into the, the um, maybe the easiest one first. Uh, maybe, maybe, I shouldn't make it sound easy, but anyway. Um, but just to give you another example, there are, there are a few other ways people are using this. I thought this was an interesting one. Um, there's an organization called Global Fishing Watch, which uses AI and vessel tracks to find illegal fishing. So what you're seeing in this map is a highlight of all the vessel traffic um, that Global Fishing Watch is, tra is tracking because vessels have these uh, uh, boats, ships, fishing vessels have these trackers on them and you can track it through time. And so they take these tracks and they put it into an AI algorithm to determine when and where illegal fishing is happening. Uh, but there's kind of a, so this is from a paper from 2002 by a colleague of mine, Lauren Dracopoulos, and she has this really interesting warning about how this is used. Um, and it has to do with how the data is collected and how it's connected with the different countries. Basically what happens is the vessels that are connected with a specific country show up on here, which are usually the smaller scale operations. But there are these big transnational uh, fishing firms they can change their flag state. They, they can essentially, because they're so big and so adaptable, they can make themselves invisible in data sets like this. So when you're tracking illegal fishing, you wind using methods like this, you wind up doing a good job detecting what I think of as the little guy and you miss the big players. So as she writes, this technique um, can reproduce and, and obscure economic and political relations that have created socioeconomic marginalizations to begin with. So with a lot of AI applications, we're finding the same pattern play out that we wind up, um, we, we might be good, well-intentioned, but we wind up in some, in some cases making the situation worse. Um, okay, there, there are other applications of AI in the ocean, things like um, filling in gaps in data or steering underwater uh, automated vehicles, things like that. Just I'll highlight a few that we're doing here at Bigelow. It's not just my lab, it's being used across our, our institution. Um, a few years ago, we started this data discovery initiative where what we're trying to do is use big data and artificial intelligence to integrate across disciplines uh, in complex ocean system science. Oceans are really complex, which is what makes them so interesting and they're very interdisciplinary. And so we're using AI in some different ways to look at genomic data which is a big thing here, um, both single cell genomics and environmental DNA, things like that. Um, we use it in ocean color and remote sensing. That's that kind of middle image that you're seeing of the coast of Maine, which is very colorful. It's satellite data. They have complex patterns in their images, which we can use AI to help us interpret. We're using it in education. I alluded to Ocean Hack Week in the beginning of the talk. This is something we're involved with. It's a week that happens every year. It's a really international sort of, um, I don't know how to describe the hack week. We all get together, we learn from each other, we solve coding problems in the ocean. You can see that map in the lower right shows some of the countries that participated in, I think that was the 2001, but it's always like a really international group um, participating. And we also use it in ocean forecasting. And that's what, what my lab focuses on. And I'm going to develop that kind of AI for ocean forecasting in the second half of the talk. So you've gotten a taste of AI, you've gotten a taste for how it's used in the ocean. And we'll just pause now for a few minutes before I go into part two and take a few questions if you've um, got anything you'd like to ask at this point. Oh, this is not a very scientific question, but you talk about uh, all the data of ships moving around and when ships turn off the transponders 
and then do illegal phishing? Is there a way that AI can identify that so that you can find out where the bad guys are? Yeah, I think that's pretty much what they're trying to do. They use the ship tracks and also absence of tracks when things are turned off and on. But, um, but like many AI applications, it's only going to be as good as the data that you use to train it. So um, they need to match those patterns with cases that they know are, are illegal phishing. Hi, thank you for this talk. I was wondering if the IPCC work that has been going on for the past bunch of years has made a difference in the data that we're getting in the ocean. If the IPCC work has made a difference in the data that's collected, um, yeah, I would say it has. I mean, the I, uh, yeah, so IPCC, right, thank you. <laughs> it's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which puts out reports every few years talking about, but it's basically summarizing the global science that's been done on climate change. And um, the early reports focused on kind of the physical changes, mostly in the atmosphere. At some point, they added oceans, and now they really talk about the societal problems uh, that go with it. Um, they don't strongly use uh, AI doesn't pop up a lot in, in the IPCC, and I think you'll see why in the second part of my talk. Um, if, though, it, though it does, it is there some. And but your actual question was, does it guide where the data comes from? And it definitely does because the IPCC will often identify areas of poor data coverage or areas where the climate models are highly uncertain. And that can guide future sampling and measurement and you know, where we need to invest in getting more data. So they definitely do that, yeah. Yes. Do, do the AI bots, like, um, the, like, the, like the robot you were showing, do they sell those? <laughs> the, um, you mean Johnny Five? Uh, That's his child. You can, you can, yeah, I think you. I, I know that I know that they sold Johnny Five in the 1980s. I bet you could still find him. <laughs> could you give a very specific, detailed example of how you use AI in uh, ocean research or somebody else's research, uh, not just education and genomes, but some very specific things, so we understand what you're talking about? Yeah, I can. And so the second half of the talk, I'll talk specifically about how I use AI and ocean forecasting, and I'll go through an example of um, how we forecast red tides. So hopefully that will, but if I, but if I don't quite um, tell you what you want to know, you can ask that question again at the end, and I can go into some more detail. Is AI uh, presently being used to track the changes in our major ocean currents? Because I hear they're diminishing some of the more important ones like ours? Yes. Um, I would say in general, AI is used in almost any technology. So if you think about the, um, the buoys, the satellites, the different instruments that we use to track temperature and currents in the ocean, um, even just in the infrastructure for how they collect data, transmit data, um, how it's organized when we get it, AI is, is in all of that. Uh, but when it comes to whether or how fast the, the Gulf Stream or the ocean currents are, are changing with climate, um, it comes to something that the research focuses more on really understanding the mechanism behind what's changing. And, um, and I think I feel like that's, this is a good point to go into the second half of my talk, because I talk a little bit about, uh, I'll talk a little bit about distinguishing what we can learn from AI versus um, really understanding how causality, you know, uh, cause and effect um, is in a system like our, our ocean currents. But maybe we'll take one more question before that. What's the current consensus on the volume of the ocean in liters? <laughs> <laughs> ask a chat bot. <laughs> you, you could ask a chat bot that question. Yeah, it's, it's funny how hard questions like that are to answer. I remember the, the lecture on what is um, global sea level. 
when I was in graduate school and just trying to quantify global sea level is an extremely mathematically complex problem. Um, but I will say, be careful when you ask a chatbot a question like that, because there was a period of time, like maybe two weeks ago until they caught it and fixed it, when uh, I think it was Google and some chatbots were getting the age of the universe wrong. Like people were asking, how old is the universe? And it was giving a, because there was one sort of obscure paper that had just come out hypothesizing that the universe might be older than we thought, like by a factor of two. And that somehow like made it to the top of whatever the algorithm is that sorts the information. And so for a little while, everything was getting the age of the universe wrong. Um, but anyway, I don't, know the, I don't know the consensus on the volume of the ocean. It's changing all the time, you know, constantly changing, just like sea level rise. Yeah. <laughs> All right. While you dig into that on your phones, <laughs> I will. Um, I'll go to the second second part of my talk. Thank you. Those are those are some really interesting questions. I always love the uh, array of questions that I get, and they they always take me off guard. Um, but I'll I'll immediately start looking up the volume of the ocean and whether or not you can still buy Johnny Five. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I, I want to talk a little bit about ocean forecasting and how we use um, AI in, in in my group. A couple of years ago at Bigelow, we started the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting, um, thanks largely to a, a generous contribution from the um, AR Mary Louise Tandy Foundation. Um, and we've built from that and, and um, grown our group. These are some of the people who have contributed over the last few years. Interestingly, um, a Tandy computer was one of the first computers that I ever used. Um, but we do all kinds of ocean forecasting. So to give you a flavor of what that means, it's a little bit like weather forecasting, but a little different. Um, just one example, we, um, we collect reports of jellyfish up and down the, the East Coast from, we've gotten thousands of reports from New Jersey to up into Atlantic Canada over the years. And we've used that data to try to build a jellyfish forecast. It looks a lot like a weather forecast. You can see the animated image on the right is sort of an example of one of our test forecasts, you know, changes in time. And the, the more colorful or the brighter areas, I should say, are where it's a higher likelihood of encountering, in this case, a lion's mane jellyfish. By the way, lion's manes do get that big. We, for a couple of years, we were getting all these reports, this is during COVID too, eerily, all these reports of like six foot wide lion's mane jellyfish washing up uh, on the coast of Maine. We do not want to swim with that. But at any rate, you know, so for, for a few years, we've been running this jellyfish forecast, which combines a lot of uh, this data with the other forecasting techniques. And in the lower right, you're seeing a meteorologist, Ryan Breton, showing our jellyfish forecast on the news, which was pretty cool. Um, just one example, uh, we, we do a lot of these. We have projects on North Atlantic right whales, um, which are highly endangered and potentially interact with um, other marine activities. We have some work on predicting white sharks. We do some work on pathogens and viruses in the ocean, red tides and toxin, uh, toxins in the ocean, fishing. We had a, a striper forecast we were playing with for a while, jellyfish. We even venture out of the ocean. So we have a, a loose car collision forecast that we run, um, I guess because I'm a Mainer to the core. Uh, we had a tick forecast that we had developed at one point. So there are lots and lots of examples of these. And like I said, I'm gonna go into detail for one of those examples to give you a sense for specifically how AI is used uh, in the system. But before I do that, I want to give you a little bit more of the background science on how forecasting is done. because I think this is important to understand the difference between how it's been done traditionally and how it's done now with AI. So I think of it as this pendulum, science in general maybe, as this pendulum that swings back and forth. And on one side is what people will call, um, by a bunch of different names, mechanistic or perhaps deterministic, process-based or causation. Those are some of the words that are used to describe this type of prediction. And basically what it means is that we really understand the mechanisms, the causal mechanisms that are in the system. And we have equations, like say equations of physics, that will describe those mechanisms in essentially any situation. So some of the examples I have here, um, in the lower left, that's supposed to be like describing planetary motion. But we know the, the, the equation for gravity, it works pretty much everywhere in the universe as far as we know. 
So I know already that there's going to be a full solar eclipse, a full yeah solar eclipse in Maine next April. Like that prediction is re really reliable because you know we understand those mechanisms really well. Weather forecasts, like you see in the upper left, um, fluid dynamics in the upper right there. Those are all cases where we think we know the equations um, that could be applied to almost any situation. And even when you encounter a new situation that you've never seen before, we think those equations will do a good job predicting what's going to happen. The one on the lower right is a, a single-celled organism of some kind. And some people will tell you that we have some good equations, some deterministic or mechanistic uh, ability to predict uh, the growth of organisms as well. Um, and then the, on the other end of the spectrum or the pendulum is something called empirical or probabilistic or observation-based or prediction through association. And these are cases where we can find patterns in the data, but we don't really understand causality very well. Or maybe we understand it pretty well, but not in a way where our equation works in every situation. But we still make predictions or forecasts in a lot of these circumstances. So a few examples. Um, the ma US map there, there's a lot of election forecasting that goes on. It's very empirical. Um, you know, the method that worked in 2020 might not work in 2024. Uh, the, the next one on the top there is showing the um, uh, economic collapse in 2008. So we have uh, forecasting, economic forecasting models, but they failed spectacularly during the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, the lower right one there is just a map. I'm not sure how well you can see it, but it's a global map of landslide risk. Just to give you an example of one from nature, um, landslides are things that happen suddenly, sort of like earthquakes. They're really hard to, to predict in a deterministic way. So we use these association-based methods. Um, and then I put that cell there again, because a lot of people will say we don't ha have any ability to, to do biology um, mechanistically. And also, and, and I guess just to highlight that there's this gray area in between. Something that's mechanistic to one scientist might not be to another. And where we are right now in this pendulum swinging is we're swinging from the deterministic side or the mechanistic side over to the empirical side. We have been for the last 50 to 70 years. And here's a, here's a I, guess I, I guess I'm learning I'm a history buff. Here's a little bit of history to that. So in the 1950s, around the time uh, Alan Turing was doing his stuff, there was this, you know, this, this boom in, in computing power, and um, a lot of people were doing things with computers. There's a uh, famous scientist, John von Neumann, who is famously depicted in Dr. Strangelove. So this is not von Neumann in the lower left, that's Dr. Strangelove. But he would say things like, all stable processes we shall predict, all unstable processes we shall control. So people really thought computers were going to be able to predict everything with this uh, deterministic method. Sometime in the 1970s, um, scientists discovered and formulated something called chaos, which you might know from the Jurassic Park movies. So that's not Ed Lorenz either. That's um, Jeff Goldblum as Dr. Ian Malcolm, who popularized this um, idea of chaos in the Jurassic Park movies, one of my favorite characters. But um, you, might, you might have heard this quote, does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? And this is basically illustrating the idea that even when we have equations that we know and understand really well, like the equations that describe our weather, there's still a fundamental limit on our ability to see into the future. Even if we have really, really good measurements and really, really powerful computers, there's going to be a horizon that we just cannot predict uh, beyond. And since then, we've, seen, we've found more and more limitations to kind of that predictive approach. And as we moved into the 2000s with the deep learning revolution that I mentioned, forecasting has really swung into this, um, uh, into this realm of using artificial and intelligence and deep learning, which is really a method of association. I didn't actually tell you what deep learning was. I meant to tell you in the, in the first timeline slide. Uh, but deep learning is it's, it's usually using these neural, net, neural networks that I talked about. And it's basically when you give um, most of these algorithms, you'll give it a bunch of data. You'll tell it basically what, you'll look, what you're looking for, and it will do the associations itself and figure out how to find uh, the rules from the data. And so I'm going to give you an example of how we're using that in one of our forecasts. 
Okay, so the example I'll talk about is um, harmful algal forecasting. Uh, harmful algal blooms, we call them harmful algal blooms. They're just a feature of the ocean. Um, they're types of algae that pre usually produce toxins, or many of them produce toxins that can lead to seafood poisoning that affects humans. They, some of them can poison um, drinking water or recreational waters. Some of these blooms, the toxins can uh, be aerosolized so people can even breathe them in. There are things like fish kills, uh, other wildlife can die. Collectively, they're called the harmful algal blooms. Um, and so it's something that we care about in the ocean. In aquaculture and fishery and, uh, and recreation industries together, people estimate that there are billions of dollars of losses due to these harmful algal blooms. There's something like 200 species of algae that cause them and their distributions are changing with climate change. So lots of people are worried about them. Um, it's something that a bunch of scientists at Bigelow study in, in, in the lab and in the field and in different respects. But a lot of people would like early warnings or forecasts of when these blooms are going to occur. Like I said, they're a normal part of the marine system, but they aren't necessarily always popping up in the same places at the same times, just like storms, right? We want to be able to predict that so we can plan, plan around them. NOAA has had a harmful algal forecast for one of the types of harmful algae. They're also called red tides. You might have, uh, you might have heard that uh, term colloquially as well. So NOAA has had this forecast for one of the red tide species that we get in coastal Maine called Alexandrium. Uh, it produces a toxin that can be filtered into shellfish. And then um, Maine Department of Marine Resources will have to close the different locations down to harvesting until the bloom goes away. So NOAA has had this forecast um, running for many years. This image is just kind of showing you what it looks like. It looks a lot like a weather forecast uh, because it is very much like a weather forecast. It uses um, equations of physics and some equations of biology that's very deterministic. Every, everything in this model, there's an, a studied cause that goes into it. So it works a lot like a, a weather model. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else I want to say. It's a, I sort of picked an animation of some of the output that it was given recently, but you can see basically the um, the lit up areas in the map on the right are showing areas where the species that causes this are, are higher. So those brighter brighter patches are like higher Alexandria. Um, but you can kind of see. So one of the things I noticed from this is that the dot in the left by a gunkwit. Let's see if I can point to this. Yeah, this is where all the toxin is showing up. And this is where all of the species that supposedly predicts that toxin is. And so one of the, one of the problems that uh, people in management and the aquaculture industries have found with this model is that, or this forecast, is that it does a reasonable job giving you a seasonal outlook. But for your location or for what's happening this week, it, it's... It, it doesn't really give you any good information. It's basically a wash. It tends to miss um, big toxic, uh, big toxic blooms when they happen, and predicts them where they don't happen, and that sort of thing. So, um, people were asking for something that would work better at their sites and more of on a week-to-week -week time scale. And so we thought, well, maybe this is a case where we can try to apply AI rather than the more traditional method of prediction. Uh, at Bigelow, we have a really great data set for doing this. Um, Maine Department of Marine Resources. So here's a map of the, if I can do this again. Here's a map of the coast of Maine. All those dots you see are places where Maine DMR collects weekly samples of the toxin and shellfish. So that they know they can close down if things, if toxins get too high, you can feel safe um, eating shellfish in Maine. But all these data points that you see down below are, um, down here, are and this is just showing four years, but data that they've collected, just showing you the number of points of data they've collected on all these toxins. And we process those here at Bigelow. So this is what one data point might look like, the, the plot over here on the lower left. You're getting information on all these toxins. And this is all just to show you, you can see how the data multiplies and starts to become like a really big data set. And so we thought, okay, this is a good candidate for trying AI. Um, so what we did, we know AI is really good at image recognition and image classification. 
is we took this data and we organized it to look like an image. So what you're seeing here is a graph of all those toxins. So you don't need to know what those letters mean, but each one of these is a different toxin. And then you can look weeks prior, at any one point, you can look back one, two, three, four, five weeks, and then the intensity of the color is showing you how high each toxin is. And that gives you an image, like an image of a face. You know, to a computer, that's just an image. And then we take that image and we look at what happens the following week. Is the toxicity low? Is it medium? Is it high? Is it so high that we're at the closure level? And, and what happens the next week, we tell the algorithm that that's what that image is showing us. Then we compile thousands and thousands of images. This is just a, a snapshot of a few of them. But you can see, um, here's the, the one I just showed you. It was an example of something where in a subsequent, subsequent week, toxins were high. Here are some other examples. And you can see examples of the closure, ones so high that you had to close, the medium ones, the low ones, and so on. And so to a human eye, I would say you could definitely pick out the low ones, maybe the mediums, but going from high to closure is a lot harder. And we've done tests with humans, by the way, and, and they can't tell. Uh, we take all this data, we put it into a neural network, and it crunches through a bunch of examples. Those are called the training data. Um, and really, you don't see what's happening inside the neural network. It's got lots and lots of equations. It's got uh, you know hundreds. Sometimes some of them have thousands of equations, different parameters that they're constantly tuning um, until the answers come out correct, till it matches the the training data you've given it. And then you take some new data and you and you see how it does. So we did this. It worked really well, and we've been running this as a forecast for coastal Maine for the last three years. Um, just to show you how, how it performs, it's not perfect, but it does really well compared to the traditional um, forecasting method that has been used. So what you're seeing here is kind of assess an assessment of how well it did. On, so I don't have too many graphs, but I'll walk you through this one. On this horizontal axis is what we predicted in terms of the probability that you'd have to close down that next week. And I put a dotted line at 50%. Being like, if it's more than 50%, it's, you know, you're, you're more than likely to close down. And then on the vertical axis, you have the actual outcome, which was evaluated in retrospect, because this was a real forecast being run in real time. And this level three is, means it actually was closed down. So in that first year we ran it, there were only two closures in the entire coast of Maine. We predicted them both correctly. Um, we did have these two other ones here. Let's see if I can do this. Um, here and then down here, where we predicted more than 50% um, probability of closure, but they didn't have to close down. Although that one that's really close to the line was quite high and almost over the limit. Um, overall, our accuracy, you can see it in the three years we've run so far, 2021, 2022, and 2023. And you can see those accuracies are, are pretty high. We're at 99% this year. That's a little bit misleading because there haven't been any uh, really high values this year. So we're just correctly predicting the, the zeros, basically. Uh, but this is still really good. I mean, we've gone from an old type of the, the old method, the deterministic or mechanistic method, which was not really usable at the level of like individual growers' sites or you know knowing what's going to happen next week. And we've applied AI and we've got this forecast that can that can give that information. Um, and now you can go online, and, and this is basically what it looks like. So you can go online, and you can hover over any site in coastal Maine, um, and you get that little balloon that you see in the upper right, and it tells you the probability of a closure level toxicity, which you can see um, at the bottom of the balloon here. Still trying to control this mouse. Um, 24%. This is our highest one this year, by the way. So just this, it's been all gray, <laughs> basically up to this week. Um, and it's still, you know, not predicting a closure level. Um, so, so there are a couple of a, a couple of points I want to make this as I make about this as I kind of wrap up. And it's really a to me, it's a question about what makes a forecast good. Um, and what I'm showing you here is uh, a black box. I really hate this term, but it's the term that people use because it's kind of the way people see a lot of these AI models. And you, and you might have gotten a gist of this based on how I described it. The, um, the example I gave of the NOAA forecast, when it's wrong, we can look at all the, all the 
all the different cause and effect relationships we put in the model, and we know what it's doing. We know what we, we, we have scientific knowledge that's gone in there. And when it's wrong, we can kind of understand why. AI models work like a, what people call a black box. You put a bunch of data in, it sort of tunes until it does a really good job, and then you can use it to give you the answer to questions. But it's really hard to know what's going on inside the black box because the mathematics is so complex. Yes, you can look at it. It looks like giant matrices of numbers that are really hard to interpret. But yeah, it can do a really good job at, at making predictions. Um, and so there, there are a few questions that I'll throw out there about like what makes a forecast good. I mean, in the case of the, the red tide forecast that I just showed you, the AI model is really good because it's giving people what they want. You know, the, the original model was maybe really good for managers and getting a sense for how a season was going to unfold, but not really good for the growers who wanted information about what was happening at their site so that they could inform the decisions that they were going to make. But some of the things that we don't know about a black box is how does it work in new situations? And this is a big problem with AI. It will do a really good job if, you predict, if what you're predicting looks really similar to what it's seen in the past. But if the environment changes rapidly, we could see um, forecasting systems like this suddenly not do, do well. And that's true of all kinds of AI. Uh, when it encounters new situations that, that aren't reflected in the data that it's trained on, um, that can be a real problem. And so you have to be thinking about hey, how AI can impact people, especially as they're used in you know, all kinds of societal situ situations, self-driving cars, for example. You, know, you can only imagine um, the new situations that you might encounter. Um, another potential black box problem is what are the potential biases in the data that you've trained the, the um, AI model on? I showed you the data coverage in the ocean and how it was really um, heavily biased toward the countries with lots of resources. And so anything that an AI model learns from that is going to be reflective of the way the system works in those locations. You contrast that with the, the um, what I keep calling the traditional approach to science. We understand the laws of gravity so that when people went to the moon in the 1960s, we could use that same understanding and have a good understanding of how physics was going to behave there, even though it was really different from how it behaves on Earth. An AI model trained in data on Earth would have a really hard time making a transition like that. Um, and then another one to think about is who is a, who's accountable when we use an AI model for unintended consequences? Because there are so many things happening inside this black box that we don't understand. Is it the data providers that might have provided biased data? Is it the, um, you know, is it the people applying a, a neural network that they didn't even write, you know, they're taking software, they're taking data, they're putting it together. Is it the manager that then uses this software that's not well understood, but has been designed by engineers? It can often be really hard to, to assign accountability uh, when something goes wrong. So, um, you know, I, I really just want to come back to title the turtle and the story we heard in the beginning with some of those words of warning. Um, because that line, guided by the invisible hand of AI guardians watching over her, really sort of struck me when I read it, when the chat, when the chat bot generated that. Um, and the way, I, the way I think about how uh, we should be using AI is that it should not be an invisible hand. AI is best used not to make decisions for humans or to replace our decision making, but um, perhaps as a... As a um, uh, support of decision making, but it's still a human that makes the decision in the end. So I think AI can help us in a lot of different ways. I've only scratched the surface uh, of those ways in the talk today, but we really do need to take kind of a, I think, a note of caution because there are still a lot of things that we don't understand um, about uh, about AI and its potential consequences for society. For society. So I will wrap up there and give you another chance to uh, to ask me some questions. Or, or Guac, if you want to ask Guac some questions, she's available as well. Hey, Nick, great talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'm over here. <laughs> I, I've noticed uh, uh, what, I, what I believe is a, is a breakdown in the weather forecasting for both temperature and wind around here. And I wonder if you've seen that and whether it's attributable to 
climate change and the fact that the models, historical models, just are not right anymore. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to speculate a little bit in my answer here because it's a little bit outside of my ocean knowledge. I feel like that's happening too, um, and I think it. I think it does have to do with um, the way the system is changing. So my understanding of weather models, I sort of, I sort of describe them as this mechanistic, we understand the laws of physics, but there are aspects of weather models that drift into that um, space where we don't understand the mechanisms anymore and we have to use associations. When winds are like high turbulence situations are things we have a really hard time um, modeling and computers using the laws of physics. So we wind up using associations, um, kind of like that other side of the pendulum. My speculation is that's where the weather models are doing worse now um, as the underlying system has shifted. I definitely feel that too. Interestingly, the, there are efforts to do entirely AI-based weather models now, and they're just getting to the point where based on certain evaluation metrics, they can outcompete or perform better, I guess you could say, than the traditional weather modeling approach. So it's right at the, I guess, right at the bleeding edge right now. And, um, you know, some people will say we should shift to AI models so that they, you know, don't make those, so they can adjust maybe to the new conditions. Maybe they'll, maybe they won't be able to do that as well, but it's a really interesting question. I've been curious about that too. Yeah, question um, back there. I would have asked a similar question, but my, my question really is with all of the power of uh, mechanical learning. Uh, is there a way to be able to forecast what's going to happen in one portion of our country or the planet based upon what's going on somewhere else? Since it's one planet, then the air seems to circulate around the whole darn thing, where we can start forecasting these terrible things that are going on almost everywhere except Maine. And this is wonderful where we are right now. Where I live, it's 107 today. And it's going to be 105 when I get home on Friday. So is, is there a way to be looking at what's going on in various portions of this planet to forecast the rest of it? Yeah, and that, and that is done. I mean, we use, um, uh, for example, El Nino is a, is a phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean that is used to forecast different weather extremes that happen across different locations in North America. Um, hurricanes are another one. You know, we, we knew Hurricane Sandy what, three days ahead of time was gonna take a, a left-hand turn by New Jersey and head right into the East Coast. And that probably saved thousands of lives. And, and you know, that was, oh my gosh, 12 years ago now, like he, those sorts of forecasts have advanced quite a bit as well. So the short answer is yes, that's, that is a, a common part of, of making predictions. I think the flip side is kind of what Bill was talking about, is there are extreme events happening now that are unprecedented. And so it's hard to know what the, they're called teleconnections, what the teleconnections are that we can use to predict a certain extreme event until it's happened a few times. Um, that's, I think that's a challenge that's popping up more and more places. But yeah, that, what you describe is definitely done as part of forecasting. I think we had a question up here. Yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, for the models that you're using um, in your work, what can you do to to increase the explainability of the models? So, so um, to better understand which data points, for example, a model is relying on in particular to get a um, particular forecast, or Put differently, can you incorporate um, causation, so causative relationships, into your AI model? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, see how see how I can answer you without taking another hour. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I talked about the problems of this black box, but yet here we are using such a forecast in the real world. And so we do try to, un as well as we can, to understand what's going on. Um, there are certain kind of um, procedural steps you can take, like pulling out one variable at a time and seeing when the forecast stops working so that you know which variables are most important. And you can, you can start to piece together 
a better picture of causality by doing that. Um, there are other things we do, uh, like um, basically trying to trying to push the algorithm until it breaks. You know, testing it in one location or training it in one location and testing it in another one where the environment is really different and seeing you know how how big of a difference it can overcome and uh, and things like that. But it's it's still really different than when you're working with a model where there is cause. Oh, the other thing, and the other thing I want to mention is now we're working with the um, with the NOAA team who produces those um, more mechanistic or causal forecasts, so that we can use their output as an input to one of the to to our predictions um, to get a sense of how much like what we understand scientifically um, mechanistically. Can can inform the predictions that we're making, and how much you need this extra stuff on top of that. So that's sort of a it's yeah. Each one of those is like a rabbit hole, uh, but there are methods and, and things that we do to try to open the black box as much as we can. Right here. Yeah. Um, in your shellfish enclosure forecast model, why did you use images of? the toxin values instead of the actual values? Instead of the actual values? Instead of the digits. Oh, uh, well, I mean, it winds up getting translated into actual values inside the algorithm anyway. That was more of just kind of a way to illustrate intuitively what's happening. But yeah, the um, it's not like we convert it to a color and then convert it back to a number. It's, it is just the original number that goes into it. Um, th this is related to, I think, a lot of the questions, and I'm not sure it's quite been answered. You know, they say that we're in an Anthropocene um, era now, that the humans have, have changed the way the environment works on our planet. And so past, the past does not predict the future any longer. And I, and I gather that the data that a lot of the, the big data that goes into your models um, must have some of that. So what I'm wondering is if AI is going to be kind of the answer to overcoming the limitations that we've now created by our human impact, changing the way the environment used to work and, and making it sort of uncertain in the future. Can AI make it more certain through algorithms and things that you can plug into it? You mean make the prediction more, uns yeah. more uncertain yeah. or more, no, more certain? certain? Sorry. Um, <laughs> Because like right now we're in this age of uncertainty, and, and I'm just wondering if AI is sort of a, a partial solution to what's getting to more certainty. Yes. So kind of like what I described um, when Bill asked his question. So, so a, lot of the, a lot of the climate uh, humans, I take a little exception to the term Anthropocene. I know there's a lot of debate about this. Humans haven't caused it. It's um, a subset of humans. I would say have, have caused it. Um, but, uh, but there are aspects of that physics that we understand really well, like the way um, carbon dioxide traps heat. And a lot of the uncertainty in the climate model really has to do with how much carbon dioxide humans or sub subset of humans are gonna continue to put into the atmosphere. But a say, uh, uh, pretending that we knew that, there is still other uncertainty in the system because it's really complex, like especially when you get into biology and different feedbacks and, and, and things like that. And there probably are cases where we could never write mechanistic equations like a physicist would want. And I think there are, those are cases where AI can help reduce the uncertainty in our model, sort of like what we do with turbulence in the weather model now. We can't capture all the dynamics with the traditional method, so we use methods of association between data and patterns that we observe in, in the real world. And, and AI can really improve that. But there are so many different kinds of uncertainty. And, and uh, yeah, it's another, it's another rabbit hole I could, I could go down. Did that kind of get at what you were, were asking, Judy? OK. I'd like to come back to the question asked a couple of questions ago about um, the limits of the black box and what do you do about it? Now, my own experiences with random forests have been, you come to the edge and that's the end of the game. You cannot predict anything outside of the edge. In other words, the method cannot extrapolate beyond the known data. Why not bring in mechanistic models at that point? Because mechanistic models can predict the trends that will break through that barrier. I don't see anybody, I haven't seen anybody doing that, but I think 
there's hints of it that various people have made comments as well as yourself. Uh, blend the black box with some mechanistic models where people do understand. It's it's a fantastic opportunity, not just ocean research, drug research, and a million other things, including bad driving cars. <laughs> I totally agree. That's a great point. That's exactly what we're trying to do, combining the NOAA forecast with our um, uh, neural network forecast. Yeah, it's a great point. Hi. Um, thanks again for the presentation. I'm interested about learning about the um, application of the, the map that you were showing. I think that's a really great visual and very user-friendly. Um, do you have any information on, you mentioned growers have found this specific information very helpful because it's, it's weekly. Um, do you have information on who's using your interactive map and if they've used it to plan ahead and kind of avoid some of those monetary losses that you mentioned are a result of algal booms? Yeah, great question. Um, so when we started uh, this project, we um, first kind of ran the predictions in a closed community because we were a bit nervous about how it was going to work. Uh, we really wanted to establish it for a few years and build our trust. We worked with a small group of um, uh, aquaculturists who could give us feedback uh, as, we, as we developed it. And they did help us uh, shape the system as it went along and, and told us when they were using it and what it was, uh, what it was valuable for um, to people making financial decisions, staffing decisions, um, in some cases, requesting extra testing in hopes of being able to open earlier because the forecast tells you when uh, you might need to close next week, but it also can tell you potentially when you can open up. And, and so those are all... Um, um, so we worked with a small group, and then as we opened it up to the to the whole coast, um, we've been, and I should say also we got feedback from Maine DMR too, because they're one of the, the users of the system. They use it to help, um, to some degree, guide the uh, prioritize where they're sampling and when, and other communications that they're doing. And I should also say, like they never make a closure decision based on the forecast alone. They always have a sample. Um, uh, you know, run tested for toxins. So we're not at the point yet where we trust the forecast enough to replace actual measurement in the environment. Uh, but yeah, and so as we've grown and expanded, we've been gathering uh, feedback from people in the industry and main DMR to help us shape the system. And the types of decisions, it's yeah, it's like um, it could be staffing decisions, it could be timing of harvest, it could be asking for additional toxin samples, those sorts of things. Okay, we're going to take one more question. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm curious about physical limitations of, um, of, of use. So there's a tsunami of data that's now available. So how, are there physical limitations to the amount of data that Bigelow can, can manage and can compute? And how do, we, you know, how do we punch above our weight in that regard? And how are other institutions dealing with that if it is an issue? Um, yeah, I mean, we've at, at Bigelow, we have a uh, we have a supercomputer in our basement, and we sort of um, get grants and enlarge it as we need to, as the data handling needs get bigger. Um, you know, Maine is starting to catch up in terms of like transfer speed. Like that's another problem, and one of the reasons that it's nice to have that computing power in house. A lot of people will do cloud computing now. Um, it does also draw on resources. You know, it takes energy and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, those are all considerations that we have to think about as we develop. Yeah, I, I, there's no like um, specific roadblock that I can think of at this point, but it, yeah, it's part of the process of, of growing the enterprise and thinking about what you want to do. Okay, well, I'm sure Nick will answer any questions if, if you didn't get your question answered and you want to come up and talk to Nick, but um, thank you, thank you, Nick.